morning. Today we're going to start the civil rights movement, one of the main topics of the 1960s. I know yesterday I gave you the uh, video A Time for Justice, which covers pretty much what we're going to be covering today. I may, uh, I may go into depth about a couple different things that weren't on the video, so take notes, uh, write down your questions, and um, we will talk later this week about anything that you need to discuss or clear up or clarify. So we'll take a look at the history of civil rights, all right? Um, we know our country, um, African Americans arrived here uh, for the most part during the slave trade, dating back to the 1600s to uh, the 1800s when it was outlawed. But by way, no way, shape, or form did did the slave trade actually stop. Um, slaves were still being brought into the country, um, still being bought and sold. And then as we expanded westward. Um, through a series of compromises leading up to the Civil War, uh, one court case that stood out was uh, the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott was a former slave, and he went to a free territory where he wanted his freedom. And his case was pleaded all the way to the Supreme Court, and the court basically stated that Dred Scott was never a citizen since he had been a slave. Therefore, he could not sue for his freedom as a free citizen. So up until the Civil War, um, blacks in the United States uh, were not considered citizens. They, they could not. Um, habeas corpus, um, uh, certain laws that protected people under the Constitution did not apply to African Americans at this time. So moving forward, we have our Civil War, which one of the issues, why the war had fought, um, besides the South seceding, was the issue of slavery. Lincoln writes the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 and orders all slaves to be free. So the North wins the Civil War, and uh, slavery is, is a huge victory for, for, uh, for African Americans, where slavery is abolished. And a couple amendments of the Constitution follow. In 1865, we have the 13th Amendment, which called for the abolition of slavery. Um, big response to that was the formation of the hate group Ku Klux Klan. 1868, we had um, the 14th Amendment, which called for equal citizenship. In 1870, we had uh, all citizens had the right to vote, 15th Amendment. Then in 1875, we have a major piece of civil rights uh, legislation passed, which called for the end of segregation based on color, uh, um, segregation based on color, race, sex, national origin, um, in all public accommodations, um, etc. So, what happens? Well, this is the time period of Reconstruction. This is the time where the southern states that seceded were re-entering the Union. Therefore, a lot of their ideals uh, that they had um, in regards to slavery, second-class citizenry, um, were being re-entered into the Union as well. So what began to happen, you had southern uh, justices, you had southern congressmen, that still supported that old institution of slavery and second-class citizenship. So the Supreme Court in 1883 is going to try to compromise with some of these southern states and southern politicians, and the Civil Rights Act of 1875 is going to be declared unconstitutional. So we're not going to see uh, another piece of civil rights legislation like this for around 80 years. So. Some things are going to have to transpire, um, and it's just going to take time before we see um, equality by law. So I had mentioned before those, those southern states still had a lot of pull. And in 1892, a young African-American named Homer Plessy was riding on a train, and he was supposed to be riding in what was considered the colored car. So um, this train had been segregated based on color. 
And Homer Plessy refuses to move, um, and he's going to be thrown in jail. So he appeals all the way up to the Supreme Court after his arrest, and this is one of the most pivotal civil rights court cases in the 19th century, um, Plessy versus Ferguson. And the court is going to rule against uh, Homer Plessy, and what happens, what transpires next, is going to really set the precedent in the United States again for the next 60 years, and that is going to be the ruling of uh, separate but equal. So basically, the ruling of Plessy versus Ferguson stated that if if blacks were offered the same um, the same um, access to certain businesses, uh, schools, facilities, they could be separated by law, and this was considered to be equal. So this this carries on for the next 60 years. Um, these were often referred to as Jim Crow laws um, in the South. Then we have World War One, right? Um, African Americans did fight in World War One in segregated units. However, um, World War One affects uh, the country as far as civil rights in, in a much different way because after World War One, we're going to see African Americans migrate from the South to the North, to the Northern cities. Uh, this was known as the Great Migration, something that you covered in the 1920s. Well, the types of segregation um, that African Americans are going to face are different. All right, we we see in the South, de jure segregation are those laws separate but equal. So to escape these laws, African Americans went north. And when they did go north, they faced what was called de facto segregation, racism. All right, so they moved to northern cities, and white, communi white communities weren't accepting African Americans into the communities um, because of racism. They weren't, um, there, was, there was no equal pay uh, or acceptance in the workforce. So you went from being segregated by law in the South, moving North to escape this, and now you're facing separatism, um, racism, and so on. Then moving on to World War, World War II, um, when white Americans were drafted or volunteered for service in World War II, um, women and African Americans, minorities, uh, stayed home. And they were a major part of the workforce. Not to say minorities did not fight in the war or women weren't part of the Women's Army uh, Auxiliary Army Corps. Um, but for the most part, that in industrial uh, output that we saw during World War II, most of that was upheld by the workforce of minorities and women. So what began to happen was you had communities, African-American communities saying, hey, if we're playing this pivotal role in society, if we're in the workforce, if we're being, uh, if we're volunteering for service, if we could go and fight and die for our country, why shouldn't we have equal rights? So World War II is, is a major turning point for the civil rights movement. After World War II, we saw a couple uh, things transpire. In 1947, Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier and, and begins playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. 1948, we saw Harry, Pres uh, President Harry Truman pass Executive Order 9981, which was the desegregation of the armed forces. Now blacks and whites will fight side by side with each other, the Korean War being the first of these, of these conflicts that they fight in together. In 1952... We'll learn more about Malcolm X uh, throughout the week. Uh, 1952, Malcolm X, uh, Malcolm Little, his, his um, birth name changed to X later on, was released from jail. He was um, definitely inspired by the Nation of Islam while in jail and develops his civil rights tactics um, in jail. In 1953, we saw Martin Luther King. He moves to uh, Montgomery, Alabama, where he sees the... Deep South, really, for the first time, and how much hatred and, and um, segregation was in the South, in that Deep South. 
So he starts to form his, his beliefs as well. In 1954, um, one of the major stepping stones for the civil rights movement happens. In 1954, Linda Brown, a young girl who, whose parents wanted her to go to a all-white school in Kansas, in Topeka, Kansas, was forced to go to an all-black school. Well, the white school was closer, um, it had better facilities, and they wanted their daughter to go to this school. So. Thurgood Marshall, a member of the NAACP, decides to represent Linda Brown as her attorney, um, who later becomes the first African-American Supreme Court justice, um, is going to challenge um, the state of Kansas in Brown versus the Board of Ed, and they win. Uh, the Supreme Court in the 1950s said separate was not equal. In 1954 and schools were to be desegregated and then in 1955 Brown 2 was passed with the intention of making this happen at a deliberate speed meaning that states have to abide by this federal law 1955 um, American news started to expose the hatred in the south one of the most famous cases Probably one of the most um, horrific cases was when 14-year-old Emmett Till was visiting his uncle in Mississippi, and a couple different stories uh, that transpired. But the most accepted one was he was in um, a pharmacy, and he had whistled at a white woman, where he was then later taken out of his house, dragged out, beaten, and thrown in the bottom of a lake. And his mother, when they found the body, his mother wanted the casket to be opened to show just how horrific uh, the experience her son and what many African Americans in the South were experiencing. So again, this exposed the hatred that um, was in the South. In 1955, we saw Rosa Parks, a themestress um, in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, refused to give up her seat in the front of a bus to a white man, and she was arrested. This led to the Montgomery bus boycott, where African Americans refused to ride the buses for 381 days. Now, we'll talk about civil disobedience in just a second, but this was a very useful tactic. The uh, public transportation in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, had a very large African American community riding it. So when they refused to ride or boycotted, the buses shut down. And this lasted for 381 days. And in 1956, the Supreme Court is going to outlaw bus segregation. 1957, um, President Eisenhower signs into law the Civil Rights Act of 1957 basically granting federal jurisdiction over the states in regards to enforcing civil rights. Um, this led to a famous incident in 1957 when um, the school in Little Rock, Arkansas uh, refused to desegregate. And uh, the Little Rock Nine were student, nine students who challenged this uh, the state. And uh, the governor, Orville Favis actually called the National Guard to try and stop the Little Rock Nine from attending school. And the uh, president, Eisenhower, was forced to call in the army to escort these uh, students into school. So you could imagine um, the fear that these students must have had, um, people around them screaming, um, seeing National Guardsmen preventing them from going into the school. But the courage that it took to, to be able to stand up and uh, help the federal government enforce uh, now these civil rights laws must have taken a lot of courage. Uh, we're going to see certain groups like the Southern Leader, uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference form. Um, let me talk about those groups now. We already had the NAACP who called for equality. We're going to see during World War II the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE along with the uh, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters who would uh, strike 
against business owners who were not uh, offering equality in the workplace, pay hours to minorities. And then we see in 1957, Martin Luther King Jr. forms the SCLC, or the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. 1960, we have SNCC, or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which is going to um, be involved in a lot of sit-ins and um, freedom rides and uh, events in the 1960s. All groups push for equal rights to end segregation and discri discrimination laws. Um, they use civil disobedience. Basically, this tactic came all the way back from uh, Jesus, who believed in turning the other cheek, to Gandhi, um, who believed basically an eye for an eye makes the world go blind. So uh, nonviolence is going to be used. Uh, it's going to be the principle used by many of these groups, sit-ins, marches, speeches, hunger strikes, and boycotts. SNCC all right, becomes very famous in the 1960s, especially for their sit-in in Greensboro, North Carolina at a Woolworths, which was publicized. And you have to imagine these events that began to occur, uh, these attacks against uh, blacks in the South started to be put into mass media. So they began to be exposed to the general public all around the country. And we see a series of these uh, these groups holding protests, sit-ins, marches, boycotts. And again, civil disobedience is the principle here. You're trying to expose hatred for what it is. So if you, um, you know, fought back against hatred with more hatred or violence than... Um, it's theorized it wouldn't be as effective. So you would see these members, white and black, members of SNCC, like here in Woolworths, you know, hot coffee being dumped on them, being spat at, um, being hit, and not fighting back. In 1961, there was a movement, uh, coalition movement uh, with CORE, SCLC, and SNCC to try to get African Americans. Um, to be able to ride the uh, federal transportation or ride on the federal highways um, throughout the South and um, showing the hatred. These were called freedom rides. And in 1961, these freedom riders were, were attacked. They also um, wanted to go into the South to register uh, young African Americans to vote. In 1962, um, upholding um, the school laws. James Meredith, a veteran, wanted to attend the University of Mississippi. Um, he goes on a 220-mile march against fear to Memphis where he's shot. So again, we mention this because uh, we see the exposure of all these incidents occurring. The, the press is going to begin to expose the Greensboro incident, the Freedom Rides, the shooting of James Meredith who lived. And then in 1963, Kennedy is going to meet with civil rights leaders, um, A. Philip Randolph, Martin Luther King uh, Jr., James Farmer, all these leaders to um, address what's going on in the country. And, and what, what they come up with is that Kennedy needs to pass a piece of civil rights legislation that is going to end discrimination, much like the one of 1875 that the civil... Uh, the Supreme Court ruled unconstitutional. Um, there's a picture of Martin Luther King Jr. His I Have a Dream speech uh, held um, on the wall in Washington, D.C. Trying to uh, expose the uh, civil rights bill and try to get people to support it. This is famous March on Washington. 1963, we see the Birmingham church bombing. This too is going to be an event where um, the public for the uh, first time is going to really witness uh, publicly the atrocities that were happening in the South. The KKK uh, bombs a Sunday school and kills four youths. 1964, we have Freedom Summer, 
Uh, this is where uh, members of SNCC went to register African Americans in the South to vote. You have to remember there were there were Jim Crow laws, there were um, poll taxes, there were literacy tests, all intended to keep minorities and poor whites from being able to vote. And three men were went missing. They were from the north. And there's going to be an investigation. And these young men were basically shot and killed and then put at the bottom of a lake. Um, by this time, Kennedy had been assassinated. But um, the events that followed really um, inspires Johnson to push Kennedy's civil rights bill. And we have the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, which was passed, basically ending discrimination in public places. Following that, we have the Voting Rights Act, which ended literacy tests um, to try to get more minorities, African-Americans in the South to vote. And then in um, that same year, we have the 24th Amendment which ended the poll tax. Um, prior to this uh, amendment in the South, you could not vote if you could not pay a poll tax. Well, you had a ton of minorities that were poor tenant farmers and sharecroppers that couldn't afford to pay this poll tax. So this ended this.